Okay, um, let's go ahead and get uh, started. Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to another uh, session of the Virtual Global Spine Conference. Uh, my name is Ali Baj. I am uh, uh, pleased today to uh, be hosting uh, a, a very, what I consider a unique and a really special session today uh, that is devoted to uh, spine education and training in neurosurgical uh, residency programs in the United States. Uh, but obviously this is definitely uh, relevant to training programs really throughout the world. And uh, as promised uh, on our flyer, this is part one. We don't want our ortho colleagues to feel that uh, they're not included because obviously they're a very big part of, uh, of not only spine, but of, of, this, uh, of this platform. So part two will be uh, discussing orthopedic uh, spine residency training and fellowship. But today we're going to focus on neurosurgery. Uh, I'm honored to have two uh, uh, wonderful guests who are very well known to the neurosurgical uh, community. Dr. Lola Chambliss, who is, the, who is a neurosurgeon at Vanderbilt uh, uh, University and also the residency program director. Um, and uh, of course, our very own Dr. Dottale. Uh, Nader Dottale is uh, a neurosurgeon at uh, Northwestern University who specializes in spine and is the residency program director as well. So two program directors at two different um, uh, institutions. Uh, one is primarily spine focused, one is skull based focused, but they're both excellent educators. They're involved on a national level and they're terrific mentors. And uh, I'm absolutely pleased to welcome them today. And we are going to ask them some very hard questions. Uh, they don't know it, even my friend Nader, I did not share with him the questions, but. Uh, I think we're gonna have a great time today. So uh, Lola, welcome to Virtual Spine. Thank you uh, for, I think being one of the very few non-spine uh, surgeons here as guests, we're happy to have you with us and uh, you are welcome to start. Well, it's a great honor. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I was telling my uh, spine specialist colleagues that I was gonna be joining you guys tonight and they all had a good laugh about that. So. Um, I really appreciate being here, um, being able to talk about the topic of neurosurgical education, which is a topic that's really near and dear to my heart. Um, as you said, I am a residency program director at Vanderbilt. I'm actually a uh, skull base and tumor specialist. Um, and so let me get this going here. So my first disclosure is obviously that I'm not a spine surgeon really, uh, but I do, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit as I go through this tonight um, about the importance of remaining a generalist, especially if you're in leadership and in education. And so um, I, I do my best to try to remain fluent and facile uh, across the various subspecialties that are included within this umbrella of general neurosurgery. And so it's kind of a, a delight to get to talk to a little bit of a different audience tonight. Um, my only other disclosure is that I'm on the board of the CNS. So um, I just have a few slides to share for a few minutes and then I'll hand over to daughter and then some more discussion. But as an overview, um, I wanted to talk briefly about the idea of training both generalists and specialists in a single residency program. How do we do that? Um, give some examples of a wide variety of different paths to success that some of our graduates have taken in the field of spine. And then give some tips uh, for the audience that might be applicants, um, might be senior residents preparing to graduate, and that might be people that are thinking about leadership in surgery and organized medicine down the line. So to begin, you know, I think it's important to frame um, what we consider to be the general neurosurgeon. And I know there's a large orthopedic audience to this group too. And, and this is probably the one place that, you know, our training uh, philosophies and programs really differ the most. Um, because the idea of a general neurosurgeon uh, really remains kind of the core fundamental of what we are trying to achieve in neurosurgery training um, with the idea that a relatively small uh, group of neurosurgeons actually go on to specialize in unique subspecialties within the field. And our board certification really hinges on us um, being generalists to some degree. We certainly can be specialists above and beyond that, um, but we have to have a, a pretty wide variety of skills that are both intracranial and spine. And so when we think about spine problems that every neurosurgeon should be able to handle when they finish training, to me, that's just a few of these things I've listed here. You've got to be able to fix fractures, whether that's operatively or non-operatively, 
treat the basics of, de of degenerative disease, herniated discs and stenosis, manage acute spinal cord injury, decompress the spine in an emergency that's related not just to trauma, but to tumor, vascular abnormalities, infections, et cetera. Um, and then we have to be able to recognize and then refer complex problems that are outside of our own area of expertise. And so for neurosurgeons, that may or may not include things like complex deformity, um, substantial reconstructions in cases like tumors, um, dysraphism, and much of pediatric spine. And so when we train the generalists, we're trying to teach them to manage most of those core issues themselves, but also be facile in identifying those issues that need a specialist and knowing where to send those patients. So then, you know, what do I, as the kind of outsider here, a non-spine specialist, think of when I think of what you guys really have to offer that someone like me doesn't? To me, that may be pediatric spine. Uh, and so that includes all of the varieties of um, disease states that we see in pediatric spinal disorders. Um, and maybe some of the more complex pain issues, uh, including stimulation, rhizotomy, cordotomy, et cetera. Um, that's often deformity, which is something that, you know, has gone from being described as deformity to being described as complex spine during the period of time since I graduated from residency. Um, it's a lot of minimally invasive technology, the more advanced approaches to tumors, um, and a lot of work at the craniocervical junction. And that gets me to the one spine operation that I still uh, per <laughs> perform routinely as a specialist, and that's endoscopic anterior approaches, which is where the skull-based surgeon meets the spine surgeon. Uh, which are actually really, really fun. And so those are things that when I'm looking at the curriculum of our residency, I want our trainees to be exposed to all of these um, topics and, and to be exposed pretty early in their residency so that they have the opportunity to decide if this, how interested they really are in some of these areas. Uh, but I don't necessarily expect every graduate of our program to be able to independently do everything on this list. And that's a really important distinction. So, you know, when I look at what I'm trying to manage in our residency program, it looks a little bit like this. I've got a lot of cars moving a lot of different directions with a lot of different plans. And my job is to try to get them all safely to where, from where they individually started to where they individually want to go. Uh, and, and that requires a degree of flexibility and personalization um, that is really behind what is my kind of core philosophy of how you build training program. And so I thought it was worth just sharing what we do as an example to kind of prompt some discussion. So we're a three-year program, and I put up here what our minimum amount of spine training is. So if you do not want to be a spine specialist, if you're going to be a tumor surgeon like me, this is the least spine you can get away with. And I think it's still pretty healthy. So four months as a PGY2, PGY3, four months at the VA, which is entirely degenerative spine, um, four months at the children's hospital that does include a substantial amount of pediatric spine because we do have a specialist there on our faculty and four months of the adult float service, which is about half spine, half cranial. And then again, eight months in the senior in chief year. But beyond that, someone who's interested in specializing in spine can have up to two additional years of training. And the, the one major change we've made in the last few years so we've been able to fully protect one of those years so that that can be performed at Vanderbilt if that's what works best for someone, but can also be performed as an away rotation um, either in the United States elsewhere or abroad. Um, we have eight faculty that have a spine focus. Some of those folks are also do things like functional or one of them is actually deformity slash pediatric. So he's got a really cool practice. Uh, and we also have a really close relationship with ortho spine. And you'll see when I give some examples of some of our graduates, um, our residents are actually uh, very active on the orthospine service if they choose to be. It's not a requirement, but it's an option for them that many of them have chosen to take advantage of. Um, and so really the key thing here is the built-in flexibility. Everyone does the same first three years because I think when you start training, you don't yet know enough about what you may want to do um, to start really personalizing things from day one. You've got to get through, got to get rotate through all the major core areas of neurosurgery and see what really speaks to you. And oftentimes people change focus within that second to third year, and that's great. The fourth year is always elective, so just a little bit of a call burden. And then that second elective year is fully protected, and it can occur as either a five, six, or seven. And this is challenging to administrate, be the first to say, because it's not the easiest thing to do. 
Um, but what it allows is it allows people to do post chief cast accredited fellowships and things like endovascular. Uh, it, it facilitates people doing NIH funded F32 grant research years, allows away rotations and also facilitates a variety of different additional degrees. So those are just some of the degrees our residents have gotten in the last five or six years. And as you can imagine, some of those degrees are done best as a two year in a row type of program and others do well um, with a break and another clinical year in between. And so just to give some examples of how we've tried to make this work for different sets of goals, um, our, this year we graduated three folks, two of them, sorry to say to you guys, went into tumor and skull base, but we did have one that uh, is a spine specialist, this is Hanson Bo. He um, is an MD-PhD. He did a dedicated year of ortho spine um, as a PGY-5, where he is essentially, you know, first assist on any and every case that he wanted to do. They do not have a spine fellowship, so they're always really pleased to have our residents with them. Um, his research is in 3D anatomic modeling, did not do a fellowship, and went straight into an academic position at UC Irvine that he started this fall. The year before, um, we had two graduates that have a substantial spine practice, but they're really different. So Ahilan Civic Mason uh, also did a dedicated year of ortho spine. He did a tremendous amount of research in spine outcomes, did some clinical work in Sri Lanka um, during his residency, and then went on and did an orthopedic spine fellowship postgraduate, and then just started this fall as an assistant professor at Jefferson. His co-resident that year, Jordan McGarrick, just did that kind of what I said, sort of the minimal spine training for our residents because he did an enfolded endovascular fellowship. So he did two years of that, went straight out into private practice doing endovascular and, and really a very robust spine practice that he's been in now for almost a year and a half. And then the last I share is Scott Zuckerman, um, who graduate of ours from two years ago now, I guess. And during his training, he really took advantage of the flexibility. He spent four months doing spine tumors with Larry Rines and MD Anderson, four months doing peripheral nerve at Mayo, got an MPH. Um, he's got a real interest in sports concussion in addition to spine. So he developed that skill set during his residency. And interestingly, he was all set to just go out and become a spine surgeon, and that was his plan. And then uh, he had a chief experience early on during his chief year in Africa with um, our head of global neurosurgery. It really changed the course of his career in a lot of ways. And he decided to, um, he got a grant to work in Tanzania for a year after graduation, doing all kinds of general neurosurgery there, followed that with an orthopedic spine fellowship, and then now he's back at Vanderbilt doing a mix of spine as well as um, sports concussion work. And as you can see, we make him carry his own instrumentation to the OR every day. That's just what we do to our own graduates that return to the faculty as an ongoing hazing process. Um, but so I think that just shows you kind of, I thought it was useful to sort of see just examples of the different ways that the same program could train people for different end goals. Um, and then I just was gonna share a few last tips before I hand it over. You know, if I was an applicant right now, Lord, uh, in the next few years, looking at training programs, you know, the priority is you've got to have great training across all the core areas of neurosurgery. Obviously, that should be pretty obvious. And then you want to have the opportunity to engage in a variety of complicated subspecialty cases. But that I really want to think that that exposure, at least to some degree, has to be available to you early because you don't want to be figuring out all of a sudden that you really like deformity surgery when you're a PGY-6 and you already did your enfolded endovascular training, right? That, that might cause some real challenges in your sort of structure of what you think about for your career. You've got to make sure research opportunities are available in the main areas of neurosurgery. You don't want to go to a place that's you know, heavily loaded in one direction and not others. And then I think this point gets a little lost sometimes in the applicants, but support for conferences, courses, and networking opportunities outside of your program are key. Because that's how people wind up making plans for their future career and finding jobs. And it's been a challenging job market during COVID in particular. Um, but these kinds of opportunities are really important. That you've got a program director and a chair that is, uh, wants you to get your name out there and get, you know, get to those places where you can meet the people who are hiring. My personal feeling, and I'd love to hear what Nader thinks about this and the rest of the panel, I think you should not get overly invested in the idea of having enfolded training. The one exception to that's endovascular separate conversation than this. Uh, but I think there's a lot of benefit to going and doing a postgraduate fellowship in a different location if that's something, if you really are serious about being a subspecialist in your area of interest. 
and trying to just knock out your fellowship during your residency can, it is not necessarily a, a, a wise move for most people. Um, so I would not get overly invested in that piece. And so then I think it's a bonus if you can find programs that offer external rotations and more flexible options, you'll be fine without it. It's nice if you can find it. And so relative to what I just said about fellowships, you know, if you're, if you're finishing up your residency right now, you know, I think you're, many people, I'm sure, watching this type of a, pod, of, a, of a webinar are asking, you know, the question about whether they should do a fellowship and where they should go. And I'd say there's really three reasons to do one. Um, the probably most important one is exposure to new things and new ways of doing things. Um, it's also really helpful to expand your network and find more job opportunities. And then for some people, it's about getting more reps, you know, doing more cases, doing more, you know, especially if you were in a training program where you didn't necessarily have high volume in an area that you're interested in, that may be a main feature. You know, I just would highlight that those first two reasons there are things that you really can't do unless you go away. Um, to some extent, perhaps if you do an enfolded type of fellowship with your orthopedic or first for, vice versa or surgical colleagues, perhaps you can. Um, but this is where, you know, the, this is the difference between doing a postgraduate and an enfolded fellowship in a lot of ways. And then, you know, if you're looking down the pipe for that first job, I'd really, uh, I'd really talk to our graduates about making sure they're given the ability to keep up their skills in core general neurosurgery. Um, it was really important for me to spend uh, the first five years of my practice still taking spine call, for example. And we have a very busy trauma center, so there's a lot, of, a lot of spine pathology that comes in that way that's operative. And I didn't take it every single time I was on call, but I took it enough to really consolidate the skill set that I had gained in residency. And I did that because I, A, you know, wanted to be a good, well-rounded neurosurgeon, but B, never knew what life was going to throw at me. And I didn't know if I was going to, you know, turn out to be highly successful as a school-based academic person. You know, it was possible that wasn't going to be my path. And I didn't want to give up one of the most marketable skill sets that you have when you finish your neurosurgery training. And so when you're doing those negotiations, pushing for that, I think is important. Obviously, mentorship for tough cases is key. Um, finding a job that compensates you well, but does not excessively motivate high volume surgery is also key. And uh, one of my mentors um, in surgery overall, the former chair of our entire section of surgical sciences uh, met with me when I started my faculty job. And I said, you know, what's, what's the advice you have for a new faculty member? And he said, live within your means. <laughs> so, you know, Lamborghini can wait. Um, it's actually really good advice because it is, it, if you start off well, doing the types of operations that you want to do, making sure that your practice is running smoothly and not feeling like you're trying to chase high volume um, to support yourself, you will be a, a better surgeon for it. Um, last but not least, you know, I think for those of you that are in training and are interested in leadership, um, my last slide, and I'd say it kind of gets back to what I said at the beginning, you've got to remain fluent across a full area, full subspecialty um, environment in neurosurgery. And it's not easy. So, you know, in my, the last week, I was an examiner for the ABNS. Everyone that I examined was either a spine surgeon or an endovascular surgeon. So <laughs> I think it was like one tumor case that I saw in the entire nine hours of board examination that I did. But, you know, that's, that's that job. And, um, and if you want to do that well, you've got to keep up with the literature. You've got to attend conferences. You've got to read landmark papers. I spent a lot of time last week preparing myself for that um, so that I could do that job well. And, uh, and I think it's, it's important to realize that from the beginning and set yourself up for success. You know, my other big job right now is as, as a scientific program chair for the uh, 2022 CNS annual meeting. And obviously, you can't be the scientific program chair for the largest meeting in neurosurgery and not really know a little bit about everything in neurosurgery. Um, to do that job well and to make that meeting successful, you've got to understand the various fields beyond your own. And so I would just say, you know, make a plug for the fact that remaining, remaining something of a generalist throughout your career can have really significant dividends. Uh, and with that, I will stop rambling on to you guys. Happy to start some discussion now and or head straight over to Nader, whatever you guys want to do.
Great, wonderful. Thank, thank you so much, uh, Lola. That was uh, that was great. Really, really heartfelt advice, and you know, based on a lot of experience. Um, so, before we go to Nader, does anybody want to make any comments or, or ask questions? I just want to say, excellent uh, perspective from uh, Lola. Actually, and um, a really important point. The question is, you know, it's like you got to be a generalist, right? Like you need to manage um, at least the uh, uh, what you know emergencies, right? You don't want to like other things that you can't handle that can wait. Obviously, you can refer them to a specialist, but in, in the situation of an emergency, you need to be able to handle uh, basic uh, uh, trauma cases, uh, intracranial abscesses, um, you know because these you can't wait on these and that i think that's where the uh, you can draw the line in terms of when to become a specialist when to uh, you know what's enough to be a generalist you know you know you can if you know an emergency called equina must be handled by anyone you know uh you know spinal epidural abscess obviously someone's getting paralyzed must be handled by a generalist and and you know i mean that's a good segue to my 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 presentation because I'm a little bit biased towards subspecialization, to be honest. And um, let me, um, uh, where is my, is that the one? Maybe it, yeah, let's go back. And Nader, while, while, you, uh, while you get ready for your talk, um, I, I did have a question um, that, that I'll ask you as well, but first I'll, I'll, I'll kind of ask Lola about it, which is um, what, what do you think, uh, spine faculty in neurosurgery training programs should be doing differently, uh, ought to be doing differently. Um, what is what advice as a program director, what advice would you give to 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 spine faculty, um, uh, you know, in general, in relation to spine training, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. You know, the thing that we are most focused on improving on right now is, you know, both in spine, but really across other specialties as well. And that's focused feedback. And that's something that I think most of us really struggle with as surgeon educators, you know, giving real time, useful feedback um, that our, the learner hears and is able to put into practice and then able to retest. And so, you know, we have, um, a, a nice system on our spine service where, you know, the same attending will do very similar cases with the same resident week in and week out for a period of time. And, and that I think is a, in some ways a really useful uh, kind of mentorship based model uh, where they can decide they're going to focus on kerosene work and, you know, until that is improved. And then they decide they're going to focus on the drilling until that is improved, et cetera. Um, and it allows you to really track how someone's doing and make sure that they are remaining coachable and actually making solid improvements. I personally find it really difficult to teach when I've got, you know, 10 different residents in the 10 pituitary tumors I do in the given month, you know, and it's like, it's like Groundhog Day every day. It's the first time. So it's sort of a general comment, but I think that it's important. I think the other piece is, um, is anatomy especially for the junior residents. You know, spine anatomy is mostly invisible to us, especially when we do instrumentation. And I think that it's really, it's probably hard for senior spine surgeons to realize how, uh, how, how hard it is to conceptualize some of that invisible anatomy for instrumentation when we start and getting those faculty into the spine lab um, with our junior residents has been really helpful in, um, I think, accelerating their knowledge um, and, and accelerating their interest in the field too. You know, it, it, when you're talking about things like deformity correction, if you don't really understand the anatomic principles that you're drawing from, you know, it can just seem like a really long day and a lot of lead. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Uh, that, that, was, that, that was great. Thank you for that. Um, Alex and Matt, um, Dr. Mamagani, again, is an orthopedic surgeon from Switzerland. Dr. Goodwin is an uh, orthopedic surgeon at WashU, both uh, faculty to this, to, this, uh, to this conference. Matt or Alex, what, what, what's your take here as an, as an orthopedist uh, uh, so far from uh, what, the, what Dr. Chambliss has, has mentioned? Well, I mean, great, great talk um, and great topic. It's so fascinating. 
to hear the, the I mean, because there's just a different way careers go because, you know, as everyone here knows, the there's a difference between uh, a neurosurgeon finishing a residency and an orthopedic surgeon. And that is, you know, that they're, the neurosurgeon is way ahead on spine rep. Uh, you know, where the orthopedic surgeon, depending on where they train, might be equivalent to a three or four or something uh, in terms of reps and pedicle screws and all that stuff. Uh, and so it's so interesting because in, in our world, you go to a fellowship and it's very much the encouragement to focus, specialize, you know, moving forward in your life, you're not going to take orthopedic call, right? And in most places, some people will, but in most places now, that's kind of the trend. Uh, you're just going to do spine and that's going to be the thing. Um, so it's so, so interesting just to hear kind of the expectations and the career path. So, so great, great topic and uh, uh, super interesting. Yeah, from uh, my point of view from Switzerland, and uh, I uh, was a resident in Germany as well, um, we always look to the US and we are fascinated by your quality of residency program. Um, just to give an example, so when I started in neurosurgery, I started in neurosurgery for four and a half years, um, I had no structure in my residency. I didn't know what I would do the next year. Um, it was some kind of luck um, that um, I, I get a lot of uh, um, assistance by my attendings. And uh, I, so there was nobody observing me. This was 20 years ago. And in orthopedic um, spine surgery, which was combined with trauma, big, uh, huge trauma centers, we always were facing a lack of staff. So we were not many people. We were doing just uh, what we had to do in a big university center. Um, and um, there was nobody leading us. And um, so it was sometimes when I look back, I'm really um, uh, think, how did I manage to become uh, an orthopedic surgeon? And I, um, I bow my head to your programs. And it's uh, really, I think, so good for a resident to know that there's a plan and your career is not influenced by random factors. There is a plan and you can rely on uh, the experience of, from other generations before. And this is so, so much better than here. And um, so it's very interesting. It's a great talk. I mean, there's, there's certainly tremendous bureaucracy in the medical education of the United States. And that has its many frustrating points, but on the plus side, there's also a lot of oversight and there's a very level playing field. And I, I did my fellowship internationally in, in Australia. And I was, one of the things that was most surprising to me was just the, you know, the difference in the way people um, are trained throughout the world. Um, so, you know, every time we curse the ACGME as we're filling out the 11,000th form, I guess we can be thankful for the fact that they force us to build those curricula <laughs> to some degree, there's good and bad to it for sure. Yeah, the, uh, um, you know, Matt, this is from Matt Goodwin. I always tell a lot of my colleagues in, in orthopedics that you're absolutely right. Out of training, neurosurgeons are, are, you know, far more, you know, just have far more experience in spine. But I always tell them, you know, you guys catch up quickly, which is a testament to also how, how, how good your fellowships are and how dedicated you are. Uh, Lola, I, I have to ask you this question. How do we get more women into spine surgery? What do you think we can do about that? Um, and, and the reason I'm asking that question is uh, multifold. You know, we, we put together a course every year, um, a complex spine course, and, and I really wanted to make it as diverse as possible, bring different people in. And, you know, I know maybe a handful of really, really good academic female spine surgeons. Um, and I was thinking, you know, boy, why am I thinking this hard to find someone? What can we do to get more women uh, interested in spine surgery? Uh, and how can, you know, what can we do about that as a, as a neurosurgical community? Well, you know, I'd say, don't worry, it could be worse. It could be skull base. <laughs> you know, part of the problem is just there's not that many women in neurosurgery. So, you know, currently board certified uh, neurosurgeons, women are six, 7%, I think now, maybe 6%. So it's just not a lot because actually, if you look at the what women consider their specialty if they choose one, more, a higher percentage choose spine than anything else. Um, but those are probably mostly community practice neurosurgeons who are not gonna be engaged in you know, national courses, lectures, you know, conferences, academic stuff, right? So 
it probably doesn't quite look that on the academic subspecialist standpoint. But I'd say, mm -hmm. you know, I think it is, it's not necessarily a spine problem so much as it's just a neurosurgery problem overall. And I don't know what orthopedics looks like with regards to that. I doubt it's much better. Um, but I think it's, you know, it's a process that, in my opinion, is improving. I mean, certainly the percentage of women going into neurosurgery now is quite a bit higher than it's ever been. Um, but there's still more, it's not just a pipeline issue. There's still more women that leave the field, more women that leave medicine altogether um, than, you know, than there are men. Um, and so, you know, there's issues of retention as well. But yeah, I don't have okay. these. <laughs> I wish I could, so, as someone so who has to put together the CNS program, I will say finding women in certain subspecialty areas and spine is one of them, especially complex spine, to be on the podium. So we don't have a million mantles, you know, you guys know what a mantle mm -hmm. is. This is not a mantle because you have mantles. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. You know, it's really hard, I know. So, I mean, I guess it makes me feel a, a little bit better in the sense that it's it's a reflection of the field in general, not necessarily of, of the, you know, subspecialty of spine. Uh, you know, and in, in certainly in a, in a lot of current neurosurgery training programs, you're finding 20%, 30%, sometimes up to 50% of the residents are, are women, which is great. And, and I don't know if, we're, you know, are we going to see that same percentage or that same proportion going into spine? Probably not. Uh, but, but I, I, you know, that did, I, I mean, I'm just quite honestly, that came to mind when I was thinking of faculty for the next course. And I was saying, boy, it's really hard to make this a diverse, you know, uh, a faculty. Um, but I, I appreciate your, your, your insight on that. It's great um, that you're thinking uh, about it. And yeah, I have the same, same challenge. It's, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a real issue. And, and be, maybe at the end, we'll, we'll see what Matt and Alex think on the, or, on the orthopedic side, um, you know, what, how, how you guys are dealing with that. But we don't want to take too much time from, from Dr. Dottelay's talk. Not, uh, thank you so much, Lola. Uh, Nader, uh, this, the, the screen is yours. Of course, I introduced Nader before, but for the folks who just joined us uh, recently, again, um, Dr. Dottele is a uh, associate professor of neurosurgery at Northwestern. He's also the uh, residency uh, program director there. And um, uh, Nader, thank you for uh, rushing out of the OR to do this. And thank you for not doing this from the OR. As we know, there are surgeons who are getting in trouble. Can't do it. Can't Zoom do it. Yeah. Yeah, from the yeah. OR. Please don't do that, guys. Yeah, yeah absolutely not. Then it's recorded. It's online. You can't... Uh undo it. So disclosures, you know, I, I usually like to uh, involve and include a lot of evidence-based empirical evidence in my talks. This talk is, there's not too much evidence behind it, you know, expert opinion or personal opinion. And, uh, you know, my personal opinion really does not uh, represent a consensus opinion. You know, we struggle with this, when to draw the line between being a generalist versus a specialist, um, so I don't represent all of the uh, Northwestern faculty because we're going to go back and forth and, um, you, you know, on this topic. And uh, a lot of what I'm going to talk about is really based on personal experience, observations and biases. I have a lot, of, a lot of biases. I come from a program here. We're really subspecialized, like even within spine. There are people who only there are specialists who only do tumors. Some do uh, deformity. CVJ, so we're really subspecialized. So that's definitely by itself a bias. You know, our cranial uh, uh, faculty, some of them do, um, you know, awake craniotomies. Some are really subspecialized in skull bays, minimally invasive. So I come from a really subspecialized uh, um, uh, practice, and that definitely adds to my bias. Um, consultant for Depew has nothing to do with the stock, and I'm also a co host of the Virtual Global Spine Conference. So we'll touch upon spine training within residency, and then uh, the importance of uh, fellowships. You know, spinal disorders, very common, really important topic. That's why we really emphasize training our residents and to become well-versed in, in the, uh, you know, common spinal disorders, especially emergencies. It's uh, age-specific prevalence of degenerative disc disease. So, and we have a growing elderly population that are becoming healthier and healthier. And associated with that is an increased prevalence in degenerative disc disease, uh, a lot of it which may become symptomatic. And uh, with time, we have noticed that more uh, specialists or um, uh, providers are more becoming more uh, uh, familiar with spinal instrumentation. You can see over the span of 10 years, 1998 to 2008, probably uh, the uh, number of 
instrumented uh, lumbar spinal fusions have tripled. We know that degenerative cervical myelopathy is the most common cause of spinal, dis uh, spinal cord dysfunction in uh, patients above the age of 65, and it's a very common cause of gait dystaxia in that age group. And in a community practice, uh, managing spinal disorders is probably comprises at least 70 to 80%. So here's a case of uh, degenerative lumbar spondylolisthesis in a patient who presents with back pain and uh, neurogenic claudication. So the question is, is that a generalist case or a specialist case? You know, this is a common disorder, right? Like this is not like a big deformity uh, correction, but you know, the, you know, we expect a generalist to be able to handle this, this case, or maybe not. So, I mean, that's where the question is. This is how the, End result is many uh, minimally invasive uh, fusion with um, trying to maximize uh, lumbar lordosis. So, what do you think, Ali? Is this a case that uh, requires uh, extra spine training or a niche in spine, or uh, a, a generalist should be able to handle this? That's, uh, you know, Nader, I love that you started out this way because I have a couple of cases I wanted to ask both of you. <laughs> Uh, you know, for like a C1, C2 fusion. Is that a specialist? Or is that a generalist? Um, so here, here and, and I think this is really the heart of it, right? I mean, we, I get a lot of, I'm, I mean, I'm lucky enough to get referrals from the community, from community colleagues, because they don't want to do C1, C2. They don't want to do, you know, a deformity, which is great for me. But, you know, I, I have to be honest with you. And, you know, I think a decompression and instrumented fusion is a case that uh, a neurosurgeon should be uh, comfortable with. Um, interbody, maybe, maybe not. You know, interbody technique is not necessarily, in my opinion, a straightforward technique. Uh, doing a decompression with screws and rods, perhaps they should. Um, but, you know, we this has come up before when we we're talking about using navigation or not, you know, and somebody said, well, hey, if navigation is not working, do we, turn, do we cancel the case? You have to do what's safest for you, right? If the general neurosurgeon is on call and they have an instrumented thoracic case and they don't feel it's safe in their hands to do it, I don't care what your pride is or what your training is or where you are, it's not safe for the patient. So, but, but in general, I personally think inner body work, it's, I mean, a lot of general neurosurgeons are very good at it, but I think inner body work is, you know, could be a little bit nuanced and, and perhaps should be on you know, you shouldn't require or mandate a general neurosurgeon to, to do that. My opinion, we'll ask the expert, Dr. Chambliss, you're a program director. What do you tell your graduating resident? Well, I would be very disappointed if every single one of my graduating residents did not know how to manage that problem. Now, you know, to what, for what that's worth. Um, I think it depends a lot on the, the training that you get. Right. I mean, I, I remember interviewing a faculty candidate one time and I, you know, saying, well, I think you'd want to take spine ball here as a person who's a fellow and functional. And, you know, he's like, well, what kind of cases? I was like, oh, well, last week I did, you know, this, I don't do this anymore, but I used to, you know, I did, you know, thoracic fusion for bony chance. And he's like, oh, well, that is not something I was trained to do. It's like, good heavens. What, what did you do in residency? So I think this is a case that I would want my residents to feel very good about tackling regardless of what they did in their specialty. Well, I agree too. Uh, the other thing that one should uh, I would like to emphasize is, okay, it's not only about putting the screws or the cage, it's just understanding the importance of spinal pelvic parameters and not creating really flat backs. And, you know, and that's where, you know, maybe doing this day in, day out as a specialist and having a niche, this is a degenerative disc disorder pathology that is very common. It's not, we're not talking reconstructive spine, but, but the, the field has um, expanded to like, you know, we, we, our understanding of spinal pelvic parameters and the importance of it really um, must be emphasized as residency because we don't want to create flat back. So certainly that should be, should be handled by a generalist, but, you know. I think no, Matt, Matt wants to chime in. Yeah, yep. Go Matt. ahead, Matt. No, I think that that are, I'm, I'm so glad to hear you say that because that's, you know, I don't want to overstep my bounds talking about what a nurse are considered, but I mean, boy, I'm, I mean, we see a lot of people that do this and make them flat and it sets, you know, and as we're learning, it, it takes them down this path that it's getting them off the path is hard, right? It might involve a PSO and um, if you could just get the, the look at the parameters. 
or it's when you started, life would be a lot better for these people. So I, I agree 100. percent I think that's got to be. I don't know if it's a teaching thing or what, but I mean, in both of our ortho and neuro, right? It's like stuff like that. Yeah, you want you want to get it right. So here's a thanks, Matt. I think uh, we're, we're all on the same page on this. You know, I have developed a niche in. Uh, Spinal surgery, I really like uh, the current cervical junction, current vertical junction, and, you know, we built a program here and we have a, a big referral center. And that's something that not necessarily I learned in fellowship, but that's something that, you know, you build a focus and build a niche. So there's definitely an opportunity doing that during your practice. Um, so that, that's just uh, my CVJ clinic, some of the cases that I saw just last week. So... What are was the that, facts? Was, of the was that X-ray your case, Nader? No, 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 <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Uh, so no, they just uh, these are just the cases. I didn't operate on a single one of them yet. So the facts and challenges. So you know, in 2003, the ACGME mandated an 80 work hour week. Okay, 2003 uh, for a seven year residency. Okay, so before 2003, the working hours were really unlimited. Back then, the field was not as subspecialized and vast. You know, you know, we didn't have a lot of endovascular. Spinal instrumentation was not really a neurosurgical um, um, uh, thing. At the same time, now we have an expanding field. We have also in our residencies, we encourage protected time for research. I think that's important. And then there are also more fellowship opportunities, opportunity to get your reps and become more specialized after. Here's an example. So this is a 1989 uh, spinal section, uh, the uh, joint section on, on spine peripheral nerves in Cancun. I just want to show you how limited was the uh, program. Like, so you can see here a, a talk on spinal biomechanics, Dennis Maiman and Volker Sontag. And then Really, it was a little bit focused on spinal stabilization for uh, cervical, thoracic, and lumbar uh, fractures. You know, at that time, you know, we, we spine, you know, spinal specialists were not really, not spinal specialists, neurosurgeons were not really uh, super comfortable with, with instrumentation. And then they touch upon spinal cord injury and then a word on uh, spinal metastatic tumor. So that was the whole, that was the whole schedule. So it's not really as, vast and as subspecialized and compare it to our schedule now in the spine section this we have maybe four six times the uh, amount of talks amount of uh, uh, topics that we discuss you know minimally invasive open uh, techniques uh, um, uh, deformity corrections uh, arthroplasties that was all unheard of back then so how do we know that so the acgme uh and the RRC obviously came out with uh, case minimum. So this is something that Lola and I, we, you know, during our uh, CCC meetings, we go over this uh, twice a year with our residents. We just make sure that their case logs are um, headed the right direction, their case minimums, and they're also progressing within their milestones. And you can see here the case minimum for, for uh, a neurosurgeon to graduate from, from training is 300 cases, totals being lead, and senior, with at least uh, 150 of these cases being elite surgeon those, in, the, in those operations. And what are these cases? They're all total 150 here. That's the minimum. Anterior cervical ACDFs, basically, and then posterior cervical foraminotomies and fusions. And then, you know, uh, 15 minimum cases of uh, thoracic and uh, lumbar sacral instrumentation, decompressions, 15 cases, and then uh, small core stimulators pump. Uh, at least five cases. So these are the case minimums. Now, on average, a graduating neurosurgery resident, total case logs on average, and we've studied that here in, in, in this paper, uh, is about 1,600 cases. And uh, this is a very elaborate paper that we published in uh, Neurosurgery Open. I didn't know that was not PubMedable. You can't look, look it up on PubMed, so I'm not sure if it's going to be cited, but it's an important paper that uh, looks at different programs and um, and, and the average uh, spe subspecialty cases they do a year based on the number of residents they get. And that's good to know, um, to kind of have a benchmark. And this all is this is all pu publicly available on the ACGAB website, but we consolidated it in one, in one paper. So you can see here for a program that um, has, um, takes four residents a year, on average, they would do 
1781 uh, cases, and you can see the uh, uh, percentiles, the bottom percentile about 1400. And there are some programs up to 2000, and these cases obviously decrease with the number of residents uh, you take a year. So the minimum is uh, 445 for smaller programs who so take one resident a year. So what do I think that, uh, you know, that what are the essential education uh, for spine training during residency? I think uh, spinal emergencies are important uh, to uh, understand and uh, be competent treating, called equina, spinal epidural abscess, because these are emergencies and these you can't refer the, those patients out and practice. You need to take care of them as a neurosurgeon. Degenerative disc disease, you know, lumbar stenosis, a herniated disc, cervical radiculopathy, and myelopathy. These are really common disorders that a neurosurgeon should be competent graduating out of neurosurgery. Um, spinal tumors, metastatic spinal tumors, also, especially if they come in in the setting of an emergency, you should be able to do them. Intradural tumors too, like schwannomas, meningiomas, neurofibromas. And then definitely a basic understanding of um, spinal trauma, what encompasses a stable spine or unstable spine and how to fix those. An appreciation, this is an important point, is an appreciation of the importance of spinal pelvic parameters uh, and sagittal balance because we really don't wanna create flat backs. That's becoming a, a, an epidemic on its own. Here at Northwestern Hence, we created a core curricular, a core curriculum of topics that we need to make sure that our residents are well-versed in before they graduate. And here we really follow an apprenticeship model. So um, the R2s and R3s, they rotate in four blocks. We take three, uh, three residents a year and they rotate in four blocks, four month blocks, um, uh, four months in spine as an R2 and four months in spine as an R3. So I get, they get eight months of spine and then they have uh, their chief residency four months in spine. And then there's an opportunity to do a, uh, focus clinical time uh, up to six months in spine during R5 and R6, but we have an apprenticeship model. So the residents with me and for four months every day, they staff the cases with me and they round on my patients. They operate with me every single day. So, so that they would know um, my, my style and techniques before they, uh, they go to a different rotation. So these are the core topics that we, um, uh, teach our residents in a, a didactic as well as as well as um, uh, case-based fashion, uh, lumbar herniated disc disease, lumbar stenosis, spondylolisthesis, radiculopathy, myelopathy, spinal cord injury, fractures, and then uh, discitis, osteomyelitis, metastasis, and uh, spinal ma manifestations of rheumatoid arthritis. So these are 16 topics. We have a total of 66 topics in our core curriculum. So what are the essential procedures? We touched upon it, ACDF for a generalist, posterior cervical foramen otomy, posterior cervical decompression infusion, instrumenting the thoracic spine posteriorly, lumbar laminectomy, discectomy, open and minimally invasive. They need to definitely learn it minimally invasive because of the superior um, uh, outcomes uh, and, and morbidity mainly, and then uh, lumbar decompressions and fusions. Non-essential training is deformity. You know, I think if you want to do a deformity uh, in your, included in your practice, you need to have a fellowship. Spinal oncology, you need to do a fellowship, in my opinion. Advanced minimum invasive techniques, as well as being well-versed in enabling technology, I think a fellowship uh, is essential. So as I mentioned, you know, we need to handle those basics, uh, uh, pathologies, emergencies, basic tumors, adenomas, apoplexy as a generalist. Um, you know, trigeminal neuralgia, I think it um, must be also handled by a generalist, but I'll, you know, I'm just see what Lola has to say about that and acoustic neuromas. And we can see now, if you wanna practice PEDS neurosurgery, you must have a fellowship. If you wanna do vascular neurosurgery, you must have a fellowship. And I think the future, what I think the future holds is you must have a fellowship if you need to uh, uh, have a niche practice. Uh, and I think the field is headed towards real subspecialization. In fact, in, the, in 2017, the American Board of Neurological Surgeons changed its format of the oral board examination 
So now it previously used to include three 60-minute uh, general neurosurgery sessions. Right now, the format includes three 45-minute sessions. One is a general session, basically focusing on emergencies, on common disorders that you, know, you don't want to miss and to be able to handle. A subspecialty session, be it spine, functional, tumor, slash skull base, pediatrics, and the case discussion session where you discuss your cases and they examine you on your own cases, usually there are complications. There's also an the option of doing two general sessions, uh, and, you know, one uh, for, for generalists. But this shift only tells me that the field is becoming more subspecialized and people are, um, uh, and providers are developing more niches and uh, uh, specific practices. So uh, from a patient perspective, now talking about fellowships, if you're given a choice, uh, would you wanna see a specialist to, to manage your spinal issue versus a generalist? What would patients choose? And often question, oftentimes the, our patients would ask us how many of these procedures you do a year, even the common ones like a, Posterior decompression fusion. How many do, how many uh, procedures you do a year? I find this is a common question, and I think subspecialization and there's some evidence behind it uh, 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 is associated with better satisfaction. So we have all these. Um, so this is uh, these. We have all these equipment here, and you know, enabling technology is a different uh, topic. I'm not going to go to it, but this just goes to show this was un unheard of, let's say, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. So these are my two mentors from Iowa. I trained at the University of Iowa. And this is Patrick Hitchin on the right side and then Arnold Benizzo on the left side. And, you know, Patrick Hitchin did a fellowship actually with Dennis Mayman and Arnold Benizzo didn't. But what they uh, learned from them is the importance of subspecialization if you really want to advance the field. I think, you know, um, and they really... Uh, uh, saw that super early in their careers and they realized the importance of that. And then down the line, like Dr. Hitchin used to do a lot of uh, even vascular brain tumors, skull based. Now over the past maybe 20 years, he's just does, uh, uh, or past 15 years, he just does um, uh, spine. Dr. Menezes has always been a subspecialist in pediatrics and uh, CVJ. This is my partner, Dr. Tyler Koski, who is a, a uh, deformity world renowned surgeon who definitely dedicated a lot of time in his residency and also did a fellowship in, in uh, deformity. You can see uh, the things that he can do. And this doctor, uh, also my other partner, Dr. Walensky, who really uh, is a, a world renowned surgeon in spinal oncology. And you can see the common denominator between these individuals who advance the field is, is sub specialization. So this is a paper on, the online, on online ratings for spine surgeon. This paper found that, you know, looking at different uh, ratings, uh, health, uh, health grades and vitals, and another one that, um, um, you know, there's an academic academician uh, has the advantage of uh, having higher ratings compared to a, a, an individual work in private practice. And definitely the years of practice uh, is associated with higher ratings. This is a paper that we did recently looking at online ratings of neurosurgeon and examination of web data and its, its implications, pretty detailed analysis. We're gonna go through everything, but you know, fellowship training uh, is associated with higher ratings on these. This patient satisfaction, you know, can a controversial topic, you know, but it's important. People, you know, uh, organizations take, you know, uh, uh, really uh, want high ratings and they uh, really look at it, especially here and in, in, in bigger institutions, very closely. You can see following multivariable analysis, fellowship training. Uh, stood out as uh, associated with with higher ratings with a p-value that's very low. So it's uh, 0.001, uh, the probability of a false uh, positive. Um, and that's different analysis that also uh, shows that fellowship training is associated also here with, with a perfect rating or very high ratings. So what are the advantages of a fellowship? It's definitely, as Lola mentioned, everyone agrees to that, is you know, more repetition, achieving competency. 
and uh, learning new techniques and perspective. You must do it in a, in a different institution. And, uh, you know, dedicated time to use enabling in technology, uh, better connectivity, improved job opportunities, both in academic and private practice worlds, and uh, increases your chances to achieve your potential as a surgeon, I think. So uh, what I recommend to my trainees and mentees is do a fellowship, maybe even two. Obtain another degree, an MBA, an MHA, and a Master of Science Clinical Investigation. Publish, because these uh, would last um, forever, and these follow wherever you go, your publications. And try to achieve your potential as a surgeon. That's all what I have. Adder, th thank you for that. Boy, now I just realized that we need to have four parts, two for neurosurgery and two for ortho. <laughs> There's so much to talk about here. Oh my God, you, uh, you know, you, so many really good, good pearls come out of your talk. And, and, you know, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking about what Lola was saying and, and then I'm listening to you and, you know, part of the, so let me ask you this, Nader, um, you know, let's say I have aspirations to, to be more involved in healthcare administration, hospital leadership, et cetera. Am I going to feel, or do I feel a little bit disadvantaged because I don't have an MBA and everybody else does, right? If we promote fellowship training for everyone, obviously almost everyone here is fellowship trained in their respective fields. How does that going to make feel, how does that going to make our neurosurgery colleagues who are not fellowship trained, who are actually probably really good, obviously good surgeons and do great bread and butter spine surgery in the community. Are they ever going to be able to be competitive in big markets or in big, you know, in, in academic medical centers? How do you address that, Nader? I mean, that's uh, this. This is a great question. Listen, so I'm going to take a step back here, and I have friends uh, who trained with me in Iowa, who are extremely talented spine surgeons, and they didn't do a fellowship, but they developed a niche. You know, they don't really definitely clip aneurysms. They they uh, probably don't do advanced uh, skull base. So they de developed a niche and it's the repetition, it's paying attention, it's going to, um, uh, 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 you know, taking ownership of your education, going to courses, learning. I mean, the thing is like you, training does not stop, does not stop with a fellowship or, or, with, or with, with residency. Training is just, you need to continue to, uh, improve upon yourself, learn from your complications, and then stay on the cutting edge. You got to stay on the cutting edge. You don't, you know, learn things in fellowship, and then you don't want to stay stagnated. You got to always, okay, there's a new technique. Let's go check it out. Let's go, and and, and then um, um, uh, you got to make an effort to stay on the cutting edge, especially if the cutting edge provides your patients with better outcomes, okay? So I think... Um, individuals and community as long as uh in the community as long as you know uh, you know uh, stay connected in terms of going to national meetings and uh making sure that they're uh you know up to date with the uh evolving literature and uh new techniques and technologies and you know you go to courses and uh, better yourself should be in, in good shape but I don't believe of a jack of all trades. I mean, and the question is, where do you put the limit? And I don't have an answer to that. I think a journalist should not miss on an emergency, should be comfortable doing, uh, you know, 90% of neurosurgical uh, uh, disorders, you know, convexity meningioma, for instance, and the GBM, you know, decompressions, laminectomies, you know, simple fusions without creating flatbacks. But I think the field is becoming more subspecialized that you can't keep up with all the literature, all the technologies, all the techniques and be good at all of them. So I th so that's, I think, um, even private practice uh, jobs right now, they'd say, hey, you know, we want someone who with, with uh, spine fellowship or has, is well-versed in spine or someone who is well-versed in, you know, you know uh, skull base, you know, they're also requiring these, niche subspecialized um, uh, practices. You know, I, I have friends who have, who have, you know, right now, like I have a friend of mine who's in Michigan. He just does vascular and skull base. And that's it. It doesn't do any spine in a private practice setting. They have a couple of spine specialists. They have pediatric specialists that, you know, so 
I think the field is evolving towards subspecialization, but we need to keep, uh, you know, as Lola said, you know, a minimum of competency treating uh, those uh, uh, common neurosurgical disorders. Well, do you want do you have a rebuttal on uh, Dr. Godelay's talk or? Uh, no, you uh, know, I think we I think we actually agree about more than we disagree about for sure, um, vastly more. You know, I just say that it, one of the points you made is one of the hardest things I think we have to do, which is to balance the desires of the patient and the needs of the patient with the desires and the needs of the physician to continue to practice in a way that's going to make them better. And so we all know when you're in your first year out of training doing a stibular schwannoma, you know, your outcomes are probably not going to be equivalent to your senior mentor who's been out for 20 years. And yet, if you're specializing in skull base, you got to do those cases, you know, and so we don't say it's wrong to, to treat those patients at that point, even though we recognize that if we're looking at it purely from a patient's outcome standpoint, we would want everyone to be treated by a subspecialist who is between 10 and 20 years out of training, right? So, so we have to continue to advocate for our own specialty to have the opportunity to learn the skills they need. Um, but it's tough because yes, when you're the patient and we all are really privileged in that when we're the patient, we can see whatever doctor we want to see anywhere in the world, right? You know, and when we're the patient, of course, we're going to go see the super specialist and in many, in many ways. So I think that's a really delicate balance. And that's something that like, you know, all of us in academics walk through every day because we're also training people on those patients. Um, but I think that we have to be careful not to get so invested in super subspecialization that we then can't train the next generation to be as, as good as we are and certainly as good as our mentors were. You know, there's that, that's the threat is that you have to do a residency and three fellowships to be as well trained as we were after residency in one fellowship or after our mentors were after just seven years, you know. We can't create that system where you have to be 40 years old, you know, to begin to get your first job um, or we're really going to create disadvantages to the people coming along behind us. I, I totally agree. I mean, it's a challenge. The work, you know, I'm, I'm all for the uh, 80 work hour uh, restrictions and um, wellness. It's important, but but that definitely is a challenge because it's, uh, you know, you have limited work hours but you have an expanding field and we need to define what are the basic techniques uh, that each resident must be competent on. It's a responsibility. You, know, you can't graduate uh, incompetent residents. Now, luckily here at Northwestern, we really, our residents are excellent in spine specifically because we have a robust uh, spine um, uh, practice here. A lot of patients, a lot of specialists and they get real, I mean, even people, you know, residents who specialize in vascular, they're really competent in spine. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's program specific, obviously. So, I mean, at the end of the day, do no harm. You need to be, you need right. to make sure that if you, if, if you can't handle a case, you need to, you know, know your limits and be safe. And then if it's an, not, a, not an emergency, give, give it, you know, hand it to your, to your colleague, your, um, your partner. Um, I love what you said about keeping yourself educated. You know, I think that's, that's the key. Mm -hmm. And the more fields that you cover in your practice, the more you have to, it, it's the onus is on you to keep yourself educated and read, attend meetings, attend lectures and, and stay up to date. And if you can't do that, then you need to let go of some of those subspecialty focuses. Wonderful. Well, those are great. Uh, really great, great discussions. And, and I genuinely think we probably need another session in the future to follow up because there's so many things that we still <laughs> didn't get a chance to talk to uh, or talk about. Um, you know, we're, we're over time, but Alex or Matt, any maybe final comments from you guys? We're going to get to you guys in a few weeks for sure to talk about ortho training. This is nothing. This is easy compared to what we're going to do with you guys. <laughs> any, any, uh, uh, any comments? I have one final, final question. Do you produce enough specialists in the US or do you produce too many specialists, too many spine surgeons, too many skull based surgeons, or are you just doing, have a fantastic program, but no candidates and you are looking for the, the right guys or uh, the, right, um, the right stuff? So I'd say the real lack in the United States is of the general neurosurgeons, especially those that are willing to live in 
you know, mm -hmm. the non premier cities in this country, um, rural locations are really underserved in terms of emergency neurosurgery care. The other lack is probably in endovascular care. And that's, you know, relative to the, the, the young, you know, the, the, um, the age of that field. But, you know, we have probably too many people trained in skull base and not nearly enough neurosurgeons per capita to take care of neurosurgical emergencies. So we're concentrated in cities and we're probably over specialized, but not or might disagree with me about on that. Uh, no, I agree with you. I mean, we definitely have a lot of underserved areas. We have individuals, unfortunately, who, um, uh, you know, you know, sometimes pass away from treatable emergency uh, neurosurgical uh, trauma, for instance, you know, because of lack of uh, availability. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's you know, in, in the big cities, it's overcrowded with uh, with specialists and generalists, but but in, we have definitely underserved areas that are super underserved in terms of neurosurgical care and that you have locums rotate there and you know you know I, I, no but i don't i'm not sure if we have um lack of or like too many subspecialists I, for instance peds i don't think their fellowships all fill right like pediatric fellowships they don't fill all of them but that doesn't mean that they don't have enough uh, pediatric uh neurosurgeons I don't really know the answer, but uh, but I definitely agree with Lola. We have a lot of underserved uh, areas in the United States uh, that uh, lack not only a, a subspecialist, even a general neurosurgeon. Right, right. Yeah, Alex, uh, you know, the, the numbers are, are around one per 100,000 people in the United States. So there's one neurosurgeon for approximately 100,000 uh, in the population. Now, you know, is that not, but again, it's so mal distributed Whereas in some areas of the country, it's one for like 20 million and in others, it's one for 50. So there's uh, the, the distribution is certainly not, not equitable for a lot of reasons. Uh, but uh, that, that, that's, uh, Alex, that's a topic that's uh, very important and it's related to really, um, you know, the, the number of residents that graduates, the, the need to uh, not oversaturate the, 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 the market, if you will, or the population with neurosurgeons. Uh, there's a lot of... Uh, dynamics, a lot of, uh, you know, economic and political dynamics behind that uh, to, to, to the better, uh, you know, for better or for worse, to the benefit of neurosurgeons, potentially not to the benefit of patients. Uh, but that's a different question altogether. We are, uh, we are having such a blast that we're over time. Um, we definitely will, will, will have to do this again. This, this was a lot of fun. Um, I want to thank uh, Dr. Trambliss, Dr. Dadale for, uh, uh, for sharing with us their thoughts on this uh, really important topic. Again, as promised, part two will be kind of tackling the orthopedic side and finding out why, why you guys only require 15 spine cases in your residency, because that is, I wish I did not know that. <laughs> but we're going to have to talk about that, guys. Um, but uh, yeah, so, so thanks everyone for hanging in here a few minutes late. Uh, to, uh, next week, one of the only two or, th or three Thursdays a year that we don't have a session because it's Thanksgiving here in the United States. So apologies for our colleagues in Europe and in other countries, but we, uh, we will have take a break next, uh, next Thursday. Happy Thanksgiving to those who, who, who celebrate it. And we will reconvene again the Thursday after. Um, and we will, uh, we will uh, put out what the topic is and who the guests are. So uh, Lola and Nader, thank you very much. Alex, Matt, excellent discussions. Um, and have a great uh, evening, everyone. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.